All right, the message of today, as I said to you, the message today is the message that is very close to all the hearts of all of you, of all of us, after all. Uh, it's, the, uh, it's one of those true biblical messages about, about what ba the Bible says about baptism. Now, I presume that all of you would know what it is, but I must not presume because, again, like I said, over the times, over the decades, over the centuries, we have all been scattered and we have all been under the influence of different churches which serve Satan uh, and they're deceived by the Satan because Satan deceives the whole world. If it says the whole world, brethren, that it's the whole world. It's not like, oh, he deceives the whole world except our uganda or accept our serbia or accept our australia or accept our america no he deceives the whole world we've all lived in the whole world until god called us out of that world and we have been influenced up to that point to various to one degree or another we've been influenced and and and, and exposed to the influences of all kinds of uh, religious religious theories uh, uh ideologies uh, uh cultural things you name it so I'm not going to presume that all of you exactly understand what the baptism is, because I'm afraid that many of you or some of you may not really understand it all. That's why we strive, as the hope of Israel, to teach people what to teach people what the uh, what is the what is the what the Bible says about uh, what the Bible says about all of those all of those main doctrines. They're especially prevalent in your. Protestant among the Protestant denominations, you know, redemption, salvation, uh, law, grace, this, that, and the other. So you hear all those terminology, religious terminologies, and you may think, well, well, yes, it's terminology from the Bible. But do you think that they interpret all that terminology true? No, they don't. They twisted the Bible completely. Besides, they they they, they foster the pagan holidays, which means that think what that implies. If you keep pagan demonic holidays, then you're in touch with demons. You celebrate the demons. People are not aware of that, I know, but that's what they do. And with celebrating demons, you invite them where? You invite them to your homes, to your lives, to your mind. And those demons can certainly, well, do you think that he's the truth? Of course not. Because Satan, the, 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 the point, the function of Satan in this world is to spread confusion, lies, and deception. So we have all been, to one degree or another, we have been all victims to that in our in the past. The purpose of the true church of God now, the purpose is to clear up all that fog, clear up all those confusion, bring us all to the same unified page of serving God and pleasing God. But again, brethren, like I said many times, please use your mind. God gave us mind to use, to think, to, 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 to use it to his honor and glory. It is our mind, it is the spirit of man, the spirit in man, which is part of our mind that connects to the spirit of God. And when I say that, when I say something, just, just don't take it like a statement. When I say pagan demonic holidays, just think what happens then to people who practice those pagan demonic holidays. What happens to their mind, what happens to their heart, what happens to their lives? Because demons are involved and they're in touch with demons. When they pray, when the Catholics and the Orthodox, when they pray to their saints, who do they pray to, brethren? Think about it. If immortality of the soul is one, it was the first Satan's deception, remember? When he said to Eve in the Garden of Eden, Oh, you shall not die. Oh, God is lying to you. You have immortal spirit. You have immortal soul. The first lie, brethren. But there are people in this world, please understand that. Those of you who didn't grow up in, in, in a culture like that, you won't understand it. There are people who pray to the saints. Because here in my nation, people believe that their patron saints are alive. They're alive. They're dead people. No, but they're alive. They're alive before the throne of God. And they pray to God and mediate between us and God. Now think about it. Think about it now with common sense. What we think about based on what we know in the Bible. Can those saints, whether they were saints in life, they were probably saints and they did some good deeds and then, then they were deified. Can they be alive? No, they cannot be. The Bible says they're not alive. Okay, who they are they? Are they people? No, obviously they're not. Can they be before God, live before God? No, they cannot be. Because they're dead. The dead know nothing. They're just not aware anymore. What does that mean? 
and then we I, i'm just giving you an example of how we should reason and and think through certain things that we hear based on what we know from the bible all right so those patron saints they're not god they're not alive they're not before god and yet millions of people pray to their patron saints millions of people around the world pray to their patron saints and believe that they're not worthy enough to pray to god so they have they need to have somebody who is a mediator between them and god and the logical question that just stems from all of that is who do the people then pray to they believe they pray to the live people who lie before the throne of god what a deception true but who do they pray to think about it now they cannot pray to anybody to any immortal souls because they know immortal soul they cannot pray to really those saints because they're dead who do they pray to brethren i'm asking you who do they pray to give me a logical conclusion well they can only pray to demons of course <laughs> so you've got millions of people in fact praying to demons brethren catholic church is known for the saints but uh, uh, fine let's keep to the catholic church they pray to demons just think what is the consequence spiritual consequences of that demons to be involved in their lives just think about it and then you have all these protestants they they've done away with, with 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 saints and patron saints and all of that but they keep all of those so-called christian customs you know their christmas and easter and all of that rubbish and all of that all of that deception they keep which are demonic holidays anyway because the children were sacrificed on those occasions to the sun god So what are those people are in touch? They're in touch with demons again. You see, that's why it's, there is a, such a stern warning that we have in Revelation 18, 4. Jesus Christ telling us, come out of the, that Babylon, that confusion. The word Babylon means confusion. Come out of that, my people, lest you be affected. Which means if we practice that paganism, we can be affected, brother. That's why we don't keep it. That's another main reason why we don't keep it. That's another reason why you should be dedicating your homes, your children, your property to the God of Israel, who hates those heathen, demonic, disgusting things. From the fireworks, they're all detesting, they're only re we have rehearsal here in my town, you know. <laughs> they keep, you know, throwing the, the firecrackers. Just think, and, and, and you should see how loud that is. Last night, it was just, there was a blast around, around midnight. Because pagans love, love, they love the loudness. They love all of this, all this chaos and mayhem. That's who they, what they love. Just imagine the effect of that blast they're having on animals. Domestic animals, stray animals. Just think about elderly people with, with, with weak hearts. Just think about citizens like us who just, you know, you just get all of a sudden you hear the blast like a like a like a like a like a bomb being dropped on your on you and you just of course you know the 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 the, the reaction is 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 one of surprise one of shock and so on but brethren that's what pagans do and that's why what we have to be careful not to be doing because it's against the law of god of israel And we need to understand, we need to understand, we need to understand that the whole world actually serves day Satan because Satan deceives the whole world. He's the God of this world. Indeed. So all those various customs that, that, that people think are so nice and wonderful, you know, Santa Claus coming to your town, oh, it's so beautiful, bringing gifts to the children, isn't that something nice? How can you be such a bad parent not to allow your children to enjoy Christmas and all that? Well, I'm not a bad parent, I'm just a converted parent, if you're a parent. I'm a converted parent, not allowing my children to participate in something that is permeated with demonism and demons. People don't get it, brethren, but that's what they are. Their lives are affected by demonism. You see, and that, that, that brings you to much deeper than understanding and appreciation of the, of the law of God. We have been accused that in the past, oh, we kept the Sabbath and we, we looked down on all the Sunday keepers and we were just, or being accused today, oh, we are so ex exclusive, so we'll be saved by the works and all of that stupidity. No, but we just don't want, do not want to be involved in paganism, Satanism, demonism. And that's the reason, that's the main reason, after all, that we don't keep Sunday and all these other so-called Christian holidays, which will be enforced by the, by the way, those things will be enforced by the law. 
in Europe very soon. Right now in the German constitution, and you can find the German constitution translated into English on internet. So it's not, nothing is secret anymore, brethren. It's not like somebody is making this up. No, you can find the constitution article 129 which says clearly in the German constitution, and Germany is the leading country in Europe, lest you know that, it says that both Sunday and Christian holidays are specially protected by the law for the sake of spiritual, how do they say, spiritual exercises, spiritual whatever. So it's only protected by the law. And the Sunday law has been enforced in several countries in Europe. The leading country in, in strict uh, 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 administration of sunday laws meaning what it means sunday law it means that no work is being done no shops are open no supermarkets that's what it means of course the uh, justification for that is oh it's a family day so people should dedicate their time to families oh really oh how 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 wonderful wonderful uh, 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 excuse to impose the mark of the beast you know the strictest country in europe in, uh, in, in, in keeping Sunday, it's still not Germany. It's Slovenia, a little country of Slovenia. But Brendan, that's going to be that's going to be a law probably worldwide very soon because the Germans are a world power and they they, they, they we know what is their, their, their role according to the Bible prophecy. If you don't know what their role is, those of you who may be new to that, please ask us. Ask us and we, we will tell you all that we know. Which means then that you know we cannot be like 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 shallow Protestants thinking that everything is nice and positive in this world, oh, you know, and that Santa Claus is coming to town. How sweet, how wonderful! We cannot live like that, brethren. That shallow, shallow, stupid Christianity without any remorse, without any repentance. We cannot live like that. We can actually, but that's not the option for the true Christians. And the things are going to get much tougher because the Sunday law is going to be enforced around the world. Because Satan, if one thing that Satan hates, it's, it's, it's Sabbath keeping. Satan has always hated Sabbath keeping, brethren. Has always hated the Sabbath. True. But still, Sabbath is one commandment. It's one aspect of our lives. The other aspect must be that we must not be dummies, spiritual dummies, if you wish. We have to be educated and we have to know things. Because without knowledge, people are perishing in the Old Testament. God's people. Hosea says, Without vision, people perish. We must have always this vision that Christ is coming back soon to redeem us and take us away from this world and to change this world. All that we can do, we can do some small changes here and there. You know, we can just mend a little bit here, a little bit there. But brethren, the whole thing has got to go because you cannot really have a totally new life, a new, 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 new world unless all this that is wrong is gone. And Daniel's vision tells you that. There came a stone without human hand. All of a sudden came and just crushed that huge, that huge statue of all human civilization. But then there is another, there, there is an addition, addition to this verse. And then it says, the wind came and blew away the chaff. Brethren, of this world system remained nothing. Not even the chaff. That's what we have to keep in mind. Because it will keep us, hopefully, away from compromising with God's ways. And yes, I have the main subject always, but sometimes I have these, these additional comments that I give because I feel it's important, because I feel it's important, because it seems to me that in this, in this day of deception and in this day of, of, of internet age and in this day of everything is, and everything is so positive and great, you know how Protestants always, for them, everything is so positive and always try to be positive. Well, we cannot. How can we be positive all the time and not get angry and mad at this stupidity in this festive season in particular and, and, and the madness and stupidities and, 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 and witchcraft and superstition practiced by all nations? I cannot be I cannot be always smiling nice and all nice and positive. No, it's not. It's disgusting and anti-God, it's horrible. And it's pernicious for us and our salvation if we don't get it. So that's why the hope of Israel wants, needs to be a driving educational force in the world. The hope of Israel members need to be educated in some basic things. They need to understand why is this world's present evil world as the Apostle Paul describes it. 
While all the world propaganda says, oh no, of course not. It's a lovely, beautiful world. Look, ecumenism. Look, we all love one another. Oh, we're all Christians. So oh, everybody loves one another. And all that. That's all lies, brethren. Lies, 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 lies. And we've been all brought up in those lies. We have to discern, we have to be able to discern why, spiritually speaking, this world is disgusting. Jesus Christ told us in Matthew 28, 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations. All the nations. So it's a, it's a command. And we're having now in the membership of God's church, even nations that we never knew about that had any Christians. Uh, like, you know, last month I had to send anointed cloth to Pakistan and India. Uh, and I was so uh, I, I, I was so tingling with excitement that I just couldn't come back after visiting the post office. I couldn't come back home right away. I just had to take a walk and think about the implication of that, the beautiful implication of that. But Jesus Christ told us, make disciples of all the nations. And then he added, baptizing, that's the purpose of the message, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. This is a wrong translation from Greek. We'll get to that in a minute. So when you read that, in Matthew 28, 19, you realize, yes, it's part of God's, it's part of our commission as well. And this plan, direct command of Jesus Christ certainly sounds simple enough, doesn't it? And, however, in our Babylon of confusion of this world, surprisingly, more than 2,000 years later of his words, more than 2,000 years later, <coughs> you have the varying opinions about the proper methods, reasons, symbols, age for, and words said at baptism. We have a whole host of issues in this, in this, in this world of confusion. But the incredible need to properly understand this topic, brethren, is greater in our sinful age than ever before. Because for every single one of us, every single, for every single one of us, has in the clearest terms, being commanded to be baptized upon meeting the qualifications. In Acts chapter 2, verse 38, in the first New Testament Pentecost, so don't ask me why do we keep holidays. Well, brethren, because the church kept holidays. Because the Holy Spirit, as a gift from God, came on a holiday given in the Old Testament. And that by itself should be enough reason for you to understand that we, as true Believers must keep the holidays, not only the Sabbath, because on the list on Leviticus 23, it says here are the holidays of God. The first one is the Sabbath, but it doesn't stop with the Sabbath. Then it continues to list all the rest. And we have to keep them all because it's a command. Why do we keep them? The main reason is because they're always reminding us of the way how God works with humanity. Because he has a plan of salvation that he has and he is carrying it out, which is totally different, diametrically opposite from everything that the churches of this world are doing. The churches of this world think that they are instruments of God trying to save the world. No, brethren, they are not. In fact, they are instruments of God of this world, Satan, because Satan deceives the whole world. That means, yes. Does that mean whole world? Yes. It means the whole world. Does that mean the whole Christian churches? Yes, it does. All Christian churches except for one, because there is only one church, as the Bible tells us, which is true, and it's a spiritual organism, and, and, and that there's only one church preaching the truth. Which then means that all the rest are preaching the lies. Again, you just use common sense, you connect the dots, and that's it. And you have no need then for anybody else to teach you extra biblical doctrines. No, you don't need anybody else to be interpreting you the Bible. You just know what is written in the Bible. Just connect the dots. Think logically. Use your common sense. And then you'll have the vision. You'll have the knowledge. The Bible knowledge. Without which people perish. And then you'll be kept you know, under protection from God. And then you'll be kept on the right path. Walking the way of God. The way of Christ. So in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, the first New Testament Pentecost, we have the words of Peter, repent, those are the quali prerequisites, qualifications, repent, and be baptized, every one of you. King James Version says that. Command, brethren. It's not a suggestion. Oh, uh, you should be. You, no, it's a clear command. Repent and be baptized. Commanded, all of us are commanding that. And then I'm asking you now, how can we be properly baptized unless we understand this important doctrine of Jesus Christ. How? 
happily, in spite of this utter confusion surrounding the subject in religious circles, the biblical truth about the baptism is plain and clear. You may ask, what is the basic doctrine of baptism? Well, let, 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 let me try to clarify it to you. You have a two, we have two elements there, brethren, which people do not seem to distinguish. But there is there is this distinguishing distinguishment, or what's the proper word anyway, among the two. First one is immersion, and second one is the reception of the Holy Spirit. It's in a different in a different ceremony. Because first one, immersion, is for the remission of your sins, and the second one, laying on of hands, is to receive the Holy Spirit. So you have those two. There are two distinguished and different ceremonies being, of course, practiced one after the other. And we explain that in our ministerial manual, which is going to come to you very soon. So water baptism is a ceremony by which a mature person is immersed quickly under water upon proper repentance and belief belief in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, accompanied by the proper words in a symbolic burial of the sinful man and raising of the new as a show of faith in the death, burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. You see, that's the deep meaning of baptism, brethren. And think about the spiritual implications of that. We imitate in baptism, we imitate the death, the burial, of Jesus Christ, once we are submerged in that water, if we don't come up, we'll certainly die for sure. But no, once we are submerged, we are like buried. The old, the old sinful human nature is buried. And then as we rise up out of the water, it's like a symbolism of the resurrection of Jesus Christ to life. And those who undergo a proper baptism are promised forgiveness of sins and receipt of God's Holy Spirit. Now, once you are submerged in that water, it's not the water cleansing you from the sins. It's the blood of Christ that at that moment cleanses you from all the sin you have ever committed. All the sin in words, in deeds, in actions are cleansed. And in such a clean vessel, only in clean vessel, because God does not, God does not tolerate sin. And he cannot have, not have touch in sin. Just like we, true Christians, cannot have touch with demons and demonism because we're Christ followers. Once we're so clean, being cleansed by the submersion, cleansed by the blood of Christ, once we come out of the water, we're totally new, we're totally clean, like, like a newborn baby, you might say. And only in that such a clean vessel can God then place his Holy Spirit and then comes that, that ceremony of laying on of hands. And we explain that in our manual. Laying on of hands. And then once, once the minister who does, who does on behalf of Jesus Christ. Because it's Jesus Christ actually who is performing baptism in the New Testament. It's Jesus Christ who is, instead of uh, circumcising your flesh, he circumcises the heart. As Paul explains in Romans. So, once the hands are laid on and there is a prayer to God to send His Holy Spirit from heaven into the mind of that person, because of God works with minds, brethren, not with flesh, with minds He works. And then the Spirit of man, the Spirit in man, in, in our mind, joins with the Spirit of God, and that's how we become one with God. That's how God starts dwelling in us, and Jesus Christ is living in us, and then we continue to grow, grow, grow as little children. We grow in the womb, which is the church, the mother of us all, it says Paul in Galatians. We grow in the church. Once we were begotten or conceived by the Father, God the Father, with His Spirit, we are spiritually begotten. And then in that womb, in that safe environment of the mother of the church, true church, we keep growing, spiritually growing, 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 growing. And when Christ comes, it's time for us finally, like the grown babies in the, in the womb, it's time for us to be born to be born, but this time we're born, the first time we're born of the flesh, second time we're born of the Spirit. That was what Christ tried to explain to Nicodemus in, in John chapter 3. And Christ tells him, oh, you're the teacher of the house of Israel, but you don't know this. What is of flesh is born of flesh, but what is of Spirit will be born of the Spirit. Brethren, when you connect all of those pieces of knowledge in the Bible, then you have the clear picture. You have the clear vision. Then you are not being deceived and you should not be moved by every single little doctrine coming from all, all the sides. 
from our governments, from our media, from our different churches, different churches in this world. We are not being shaken by all that because we know what is written in the Bible. That's why it is important to pay attention. That's why it is important to have a proper interpretation of the Bible so that we will not be moved and we will not be deceived. And the question is, then, how can we be properly baptized unless we understand this important doctrine of Jesus Christ? So those who undergo a proper baptism are promised forgiveness of sins and receipt of God's Holy Spirit. But the usual teachings of this world, you can just imagine that certainly many religionists would disagree with what I have just said about, about baptism, even though each part that I've said can be proven from the Bible. But what does this world know about the Bible, brethren? Sometimes it's even difficult because people have lived so much in, in deception. It's difficult for me sometimes in my culture, and probably in your cultures, you probably face similar things. It's very difficult to explain to them some simple, or at least to be simple and logical teachings of God because people don't seem to be able to comprehend it. It's difficult to explain to them, even though Christ says those words. Let me give you an example. Oh, you know, uh, I love my wife, I'm married, and, you know, we'll know. well, fine. While you're in, in the flesh, you're, you know, it, the marriage is the first institution in the Bible. You, you love your wife. That's brilliant. That's how it should be. It's wonderful. But in the kingdom of God, it's not going to be so. There is no marriage in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God, now don't mistake again, the world, the nations in the flesh will be under the kingdom of God because Paul says very clearly in the Bible that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So while we're still in flesh and blood, we are not inheriting the kingdom. We have to be, we have to be, that's what baptism is. That's all part of baptism ceremony. We have to be changed from flesh to spirit in order to enter the kingdom of God because we cannot enter into the flesh, into the flesh and blood. We have to become spiritual beings like Jesus Christ is. And then the kingdom of God is not the world still made up of humans and stuff. The world is not the kingdom of God, brethren, not even after Jesus Christ's return. Please get it. The world is going to be submitted to the government of God, to the ruling of Christ and his saints. So the world is not the kingdom of God. Don't be mistaken. The world will be under the government, under the rulership of the kingdom of God. Because flesh and blood, and there'll be still flesh and blood humans, and then people come to me and say, but you know, they're, they're human. Yes, humans who are in flesh and blood, yes, they can have marriage still. And there'll be children. Yes, the children are meshed in the kingdom. Of course, yes. But those people are under the kingdom of God. They're not the kingdom. To become the kingdom, they have to be born again of the spirit. And they have to become spiritual beings. But then you have people who, oh, once we become spirit beings, we, we cannot have marriage anymore. There is no need for marriage. But you cannot explain it to people. You know, you're not flesh anymore. You're not flesh. You're not blood anymore. You don't, do not depend. You do not depend on on the air. You do not de depend on material things. You do not depend on marital marital life after all, because you're become spiritual beings. You're just now independent, perfect spiritual being that cannot sin anymore, part of God's family. And Jesus Christ explains that. And then I quote them, Jesus Christ's word. I said, this is your Savior saying, because the Pharisees were tempting him. Oh, this woman was buried to this, that, and the other. All these three guys have died. Who is she going to be in the world to come? Pharisees were tempting Jesus, of course. And the answer is clear. Nobody. They'll be like angels, Jesus Christ says, because there'll be no marriage in the kingdom of God. So brethren, please get it. There'll be no marriage and marital life in the kingdom of God. Because we become spirit. Once you become spirit, there is no sexual relations anymore. There is no need for, 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 for that because the, uh, you know, we can procreate and have children while we're in flesh and blood. Yes, because they all have this incredible human potential to become spirit beings. But once we all become all spirit beings, there's no more this material, if you want, intercourse between sexes. That's it. But some people don't get it because they, they just cannot. <laughs> they know, oh, that's not what I want. Well, you may not want it, but God, Jesus Christ says that it is how it is, that it will be how it will be. And his words, if the Bible is our guide, his words have, 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 have authority. Not what we want, you know, what we, we desire, not we, we, not, not what we thought. Many people think that they knew uh, or, or, or they, they, yeah, or they, they believe in God. Yes, you know. But brethren, they believe in God in their own terms. 
they envision God as Santa Claus coming to town and they're giving you gifts and whatever they desire, they'll get, you know. Oh, there is that funny, funny song. Oh, Lord, won't you buy me Mercedes Benz? You might know that song. So if they envision Mercedes Benz, if they envision to have a happy marriage and happy home and happy everything, oh, God is all going to grant you. No, he will not. Because people don't want to face the fact that, yes, there are other parts of the Bible saying that through many trials we are to enter into the kingdom. And those trials, you don't know what it might imply. A loss of children, car accidents, wars, horrible things, abuse of animals all over around you, which causes emotional anguish and all of that. Brethren, we, we, we with the Bible has... The Bible is very clear about some very bad and horrible things that happen already and that will be happening yet. But usually we're just thinking, oh no, we don't want to think about that. No, we won't, don't want to think about that here. You know, the Apostle Paul says, if you're unmarried, it's fine. Stay like I am. He wasn't married. It's better for you because it's easier life. And some of you who are involved with uh, unconverted spouses know what it means now. And the rest of us who don't have unconverted spouses can learn from you what kind of anguish and horror that is. So that's one part. But, you know, people just love this other thing. Oh, you know, everything should be married and happy. You know, that Protestant this kind of thing. Oh, you know, everything is positive, nice. And, well, it's not. The Apostle Paul also said it's good if you stay like I am. Meaning no children, no wife, no husband. Fine. Because there is also that verse in, in, in the words of Jesus Christ. Woe be to those who have those wombs that gave birth. And woe be to, 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 to women that were suckling. The, the, woe the, for those who have suckling children and all that. Brethren, it's not in vain there. It's a reason why it is there. And it's not that God hates children or women or men or whatever. No, it is a practical advice for us. So if God didn't give you a wife, didn't give you a marriage, fine. Be happy. Being a single, be happy. Be happy and be thankful to God. There is a reason why he didn't give it to you. Perhaps some of you will be bad husbands or bad wives or whatever. But you know, people always have this idealistic vision of themselves. Be happy. There is a reason why and that's fine. Perhaps the, the, the economic situation in the world will be getting, uh, we were discussing that last night, will be getting so bad that you'll not be able to feed your children. What's the point of having children that you can watch them suffer and starve to death? Or being killed by a disease or, or whatever. What's the purpose, I'm asking you? Perhaps that's why God says, well, let me just uh, spare you from that. And let me just, you know, it's better for you to be single. Let me, be, let me spare you from all that anguish that will kill you. Some people may be, may, do you understand this? You, you don't because you don't think about those terms. But brethren, I have to tell you those things. Some people, when the great tribulation comes, they, 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 their children might be dying, might die on their, on, in their arms. And some people may be tempted to take their own lives and this just, you know, discard the fact that doing that would probably qualify them for, for our pardonable sin. Some people may lose their lives, eternal lives, because of having children that may die or whatever. That's why perhaps God is trying to spare you from that. <laughs> And that's why God is not calling every, calling every, uh, calling everybody. He called some of us. That he probably saw that we could survive those horrible things coming up, and not committing the unpardonable sin. Think about that, brethren. Think about that sometimes, and and just 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 realize that yes, there are th things in the Bible we cannot ignore. We can, but it doesn't do any good. Like people, you know, today in these churches of God, most of them, oh, they will just ignore about the Great Tribulation. It's too negative. Well, what do you mean it's too negative? It's prophesied. It's part of the Bible, whether you like it or not. But the problem of being lukewarm, lukewarm Laodicean uh, members, brethren, is, is the problem is that they cannot envision how horrible the Great Tribulation would be. That's one of the reasons why I don't trust Jesus Christ. He tells them, I'm the truth, and I'm the way to the Laodiceans. Why does he tell them that? Because they obviously don't think that, you know, all that he says in the Bible, oh, certainly, they, certainly the, the Great Tribulation will not be all that horrible. 
when I was in college, there were students, fellow students of mine, they were just saying, oh, it would be great fun to go through the Great Tribulation. Would you believe that, brethren, how stupid and dumb that is? Because they've never been through any hardship anyway. The Great Tribulation is so horrible that it might be a temptation for some to give up on eternal life, brethren. That's what the Laodiceans actually offered. Sacrifice what you cherished as your dearest property, your lives, sacrifice them for the sake of witness to the world or just lose it just lose it completely rather than being lukewarm all the time now make a decision make it or break it that's what it is but that's that's how important that's how that's how serious is the calling from god and we better understand it and the proper baptism we have to understand because it's the first repentance then repentance and then baptism is command and it's the step to salvation. There are some people who also misunderstand one biblical verse and they conclude that they may or even should baptize for the dead. Now you may not know what, which denomination practices that. It's Mormons, by the way. That means to them that they may be baptized in place or and for the benefit of a deceased person because those oh that deceased person were not converted. They were not baptized. So let me be baptized for them. Mormons practice that, by the way. And finally, in all of this confusion, some people misunderstand John the Baptist's words that Jesus Christ would baptize with the Holy Spirit. John in Matthew 3, uh, chapter 3, verse 11. Which they take to be, and the first event of baptism in uh, the first Pentecost in the New Testament, when, when the apostle began speaking not gibberish languages and stupidities, the apostle was speaking known and understood languages so that all those who came to Jerusalem and there were people from all over the world coming to Jerusalem because Pentecost was a, a, a was a, um, uh, what's the word in English? I don't know, but it was a it was a holiday when people would leave their home and and and, and go to uh, uh, you know go to to Jerusalem to hold to keep that festival anyway. And there were people all over the world speaking different languages, and the apostles were given a gift, amazing gift, to speak the languages, but understood true, real languages. Not all this gibberish and rubbish at these Pentecostal meetings when they, as a sign of having the Holy Spirit, they have to speak in unknown languages. Stupidity, brethren. Another of, another of Satan's deception. But you see, I told you, if he deceives the whole world, that means all the races, all the nations, all the churches, even though they may say we are Christians and stuff, all the Christians, nominal Christians, he does deceive. In fact, it says Jesus Christ told us that that, that the deception will be so great that even the chosen ones, even the elect might be deceived, brethren. That's what it says. So you have to be always extra careful that no, we don't know everything about the Bible. Yes, we might have lived certain traditions and things. No, there are always things to learn about the Bible, to learn about Bible history. That's why we have Sabbath services. That's why God raised his church to teach the world the truth. And to teach us in the church the truth. To re-educate us. That's why I often tell you, I don't want to have spiritual dummies coming, sitting in, uh, you know, in the church and thinking that keeping the Sabbath is the greatest achievement in the world. Brethren, the Sabbath is signed between us and God. The world may know or may not know that we keep the Sabbath, but that's not the primary thing. The world should know that we are honest people, people without compromising people who have character, brethren. Character, without holy, righteous character, nobody will enter into the kingdom of God. We could be keeping the Sabbath and still behaving like the people in the world. So what's the difference between us and the people in the world in keeping the Sabbath? Sabbath could become just a ritual for many people, perhaps it has become. That's why we have the booklet about the Sabbath. I think it's one of the best pieces of literature on the subject, brethren. Why do we keep the Sabbath? That it's a separate covenant, but between us and God and not us and the world. And, the world. and sorry if I raise my voice sometimes, and it, it may just irritate some of you. I understand that I raise my voice because sometimes I'm not sure how many people really understand what I'm saying, you know. Last night, I had three times to repeat in English language and even in Spanish to ask somebody to find something uh, something online that I asked for. I'm not sometimes, I'm just, uh, uh, you know, and it was something that has nothing to do with direct spirituality. So I'm, sometimes I wonder how much people really understand what I'm saying and how much they connect the dots, how much they include and involve their mind 
in not only listening but discerning and understanding so that's I, I appreciate that in nasir in his opening prayer said please let us understand what is being taught exactly we need to understand the bible teachings so that we can be properly understanding them we can be properly then teach those uh, doctrines in the world to come not only to the gentiles today because they won't understand it because all the world is deceived but brethren we're prepared for the world to come we are not here in these churches being raised so that we can save the world no if god wanted to save the world he would have done it he doesn't need any of us we are here being called into the truth that we ourselves be educated be prepared to be the teachers in the world to come please get it that's the purpose of our calling our calling is not to go out out there and 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 and, and, and try to convert the gentiles it's not going to work because it's not the time for that the gentiles will be converted and taught in the world to come and for somebody to teach them somebody needs to be prepared and trained right now that's why the church of god that's why the hope of israel worldwide church of god exists brethren please get it but we've been so much under the influence of all of these various various uh, doctrines and theories and Protestantism and, and Catholicism and witchcraft and you name it. And then some of those some of those theories and their teachings are creeping in our mind, which to us they seem logical and, and, and whatever. They seem to be logical and acceptable, and we just accept it like oh yeah, uh, take it for granted, as they say in English. And then we stay the same like the rest of the world. But hey, we keep the Sabbath. We keep the Sabbath. Look how righteous we are. No, we are not. It's Christ's righteousness being described to us. What is justification? You have a message on that on, on our YouTube channel. Oh, we are, you know, we keep the Sabbath. Look how special, wonderful we are. No, we are not. Because we can be as dumb and we can be just as uneducated and be even worse when it comes to knowledge of the Bible, worse even than the Protestants and, and, and other people because, because of our self-righteousness. Look how wonderful we are. We keep the Sabbath all marvelous. No, brethren, Sabbath keeping is just one aspect of Christian, Christian life. And the other aspect, which is very important, is that you learn that we are schooled for eternal life and that you learn, that you discern, that you're always open-minded to be teachable and submissive to be taught. Because once again, I tell you, there are many things that we think we understand, we know, but we don't. We don't. If I would ask you people in Africa about certain things that you need to understand, to understand Bible prophecy, like kingdom of, not kingdom of God, but kingdom of Babylon, and what is the Roman Empire and stuff, most of you would probably be puzzled. Because in your education system, you never learn about Roman Empire. Who cares about Roman Empire? That was in Europe. You in Africa have your own histories, have your own local things, uh, and that's what you learn. But we who live in Europe, we have to teach you, inform you about that history because it's intricately involved in our faith. I told you about Sunday Law. Sunday law already being practiced by several European countries. Slovenia being the leader in that. And you might say, isn't that the mark of the beast? Yes, indeed, that's the mark of the beast. Because all idolatry is mark of the beast. And now what is Sunday? What is being done on Sunday? Well, on Sunday they go to those Sunday-keeping churches with all those pagan rituals and all their pagan temples and all of that so-called christian and you know they celebrate god of sun they don't celebrate jesus christ certainly they said certain self don't celebrate true god no they celebrate they celebrate better they celebrate sun god but i mean we need to be able as the future teachers in the world tomorrow we need to be able to discern those things now and be in preparation because tomorrow we'll have all the world under the kingdom of god People of flesh and blood, that they need to be taught the way of salvation. Because only with Christ returns, he'll open up the gates of knowledge and the gates of salvation for all the nations. It's not today, brethren. Today, Satan is ruling the world and deceiving the whole nations. God is, however, God has been calling only individuals to his truth. That's fine. He gave to those individuals, to us, the commission the commission to preach the gospel, the commission to baptize people in all the nations, the commission to look after the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
But he didn't say, go and convert the whole world. Because, brethren, that's impossible. And that's not us to do, after all. It's only you know, God's prerogative to do that. But I'm saying that, you may say, well, isn't that something that we should... Well, it's something that we should understand, but I'm saying that because I've been into various cultures, into various people, hearing all kinds of things. People who keep the Sabbath, by the way, so they're not Gentiles, they're just people keeping the Sabbath. And I heard all kinds of things that are wrong, brethren, wrong. Wrong, 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 because people do not understand why they have been called today and now into the Church of God. Why they have been called today to keep the Sabbath. Why they have been called today to preach the Gospel. Brethren, people don't get it. They think it is to convert the world, to turn around people's hearts. No, brethren, no, 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 and no. If that was the purpose, then uh, God could have done it all before us and without us. He gave us all that to prepare. He gave us that work of God of preaching the gospel to prepare us for the kingdom to come, brethren, in which then we will be able then to teach and then Satan will be removed and there'll be no this deception anymore and then we can be working on saving the world, brethren, but when Christ comes, not before. But many people don't get it and I'm afraid many Sabbath keepers, whoever they are, do not get it. One of the reasons why they don't get it is because they don't keep the holidays, which teach us exactly, you know, how God works on saving all of humanity because God wants everybody to be saved. Yes, he wants everybody to, to repent. It's true, brethren, it's true. He does want it, but he's doing it according to his plan. And it is his plan that is totally diametrically opposite from all the churches of this world. And part of that plan, of course, is, is, is baptism. But I'm just saying, giving you all of these side comments because, you know, True Christian life is much more than just keeping the Sabbath and going to the church on the Sabbath. It can become a ritual very easily. An empty ritual that just produces nothing. And so, confusion is big. Obviously, it needs to be wiped away. It needs to be cleared. And, uh, you know, we should review, first of all, the very clear command that we be baptized when, which states in part, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, Acts chapter 2 to 38. And of course, now you get confused. If you're thinking what I'm saying, you'll say, oh, didn't it say in, in, previously in Matthew that we should be baptized into the Father, into the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Yes, that's what it's written. It's a wrong translation from Greek. So get out Trinity out of your mind. Trinity is anti-God, anti-Christ, uh, 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 preaching Antichrist doctrine Get it out of your mind Trinity doesn't exist God is a family Into which innumerable Countless people can be born And when we get born again And when the rest of the world When it comes under the government of God One is born of the spirit They will be added into God's family Because that's what the word Elohim means And each family Every family has got more than one members brethren. Why is it so difficult for people to get it you do have one last name. Take last name Freeze. Last name of our treasurer. Yes, but it's a family. It's a family last name. He's a Freeze, but he's one person. And one person cannot be a family. Family always has more than one member. Why is it so difficult for people to understand that Jesus Christ and Father, they say, oh, they're one. Yes, they're one in spirit. They're one in intent, in purpose. But they're two separate beings. Gospel of John tells us that in the beginning was, that's the real beginning of the Bible, was the Father and the Word. Why is it so difficult for people to grasp those things? I do not know. But anyway, why is it so difficult? Because many of you are family people. We're all part of family. Our own family or extended family, you name it. But every single family has got more than one members. So Randy Freeze is one person, but yes, he Freeze is his wife. Freeze are he Freeze are, are, are is the name of his children. So 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 you've got one family. That's what it means being one. That God is one. He's one community, one family. And just like in any family, countless number of children can be born. That's the same with God's family. God projected Himself and His nature through our human families. So that means that the family is open. It's not closed trinity that nobody could know. And God is Spirit, Holy Spirit, by the way, is not a trinity. It's not a person. Because you cannot pour the Holy Spirit into the hearts of people, as says in Romans 5.5. 5. The person cannot be poured into somebody's heart. And it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. 
No person cannot be a gift to somebody else. You know, it doesn't make any sense, does it? The whole Trinity, Trinity teaching makes no sense whatsoever. And God is not Trinity. But yes, it says, wrong translation, to baptize them into the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So it seems like God is a Trinity. No, not at all. Here we, we clearly see, you know, uh, baptize them in the name of Jesus Christ. In the name of our Lord and Savior. That's it. For the remission of sins, you're being baptized once you're plunged into the water. That's the first part of baptism. And then, and then you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit once you get out of the water. You have laying on of hands and then you can receive the Holy Spirit. We explain that in our service manual. But brethren, it's important for you, especially you who are the leaders in the God's church, it's important for you to clear up your mind out of these confusions. Especially those of you who come from the countries that are not where nominal Christianity is not even 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 the, the, the case, but the nominal nominal religion, the established religion is Buddhism, Hinduism, uh, paganism, witchcraft, you name it. When I was in Africa in 2017, I basically screamed at those people listening to me. I said, shame on all of you. You all keep Sunday because white man has come with its wrong religion and white man told you Sunday is a day of rest and you just accepted it without any critical thinking, without checking your Bible. If you checked your Bible, you would probably realize that it's not Sunday. And the whole world is just uncritical, brethren. People just accept what is modern. Oh, Trinity is a modern doctrine. Oh, ecumenism is a modern trend. Oh, New Year is a modern thing to do. Oh, Christmas and Easter are modern holidays, the greatest Christian holidays, brethren. That's not true. Find me in the Bible where it says that Easter and, and Christmas are the greatest holidays for Christians. It's nowhere in the Bible. God gave a list of his commands, commanded holidays to be kept. And it is there for reason. And it's for reason why we keep them, brethren. Because if you don't keep them, then you're lost. You're just in confusion of this world. Then you will really think that Christmas is really the real birth of Jesus Christ. Of course it's not. Old Roman pagan custom which Romans inherited from the pagans, from other pagans, from Egyptians, from, from Mesopotamia, and so on. And to all those all of you in Africa, leaders there, just tell your people what I told them. I have no, you know, I have no, I have not these racial, racial problems. I'm racist. No, I'm not racist. I'm just very, very realistic. White men came to your continent as, 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 as a ruler. Fine. They colonized Africa. Horrible. They exploited that. They'll colonize Africa again, by the way, by the same Germany and the same United States of Europe. You don't understand that. If you don't, please ask. We will explain to you. It's prophesied. So they came and they brought their religion. So what African people did, for example, I'm taking Africa as an example, they just ditched, from one, they just ditched their, 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 their animistic native religion and they said, oh, let's be now important. Let's now keep Sunday, build the Sunday keeping churches and we will, yes, and wonderful, we are now Christians. No, you're not. You're still pagans, but different kind of pagans, brethren, if you just think that way. So many Africans are all just different kind of pagans now. They just accepted without any critical thinking, checking on the Bible. They accepted Sunday as a day of rest, which is not checking all of your dialects and in your Swahili language and so on. I'm sure that it's the word probably translated there has to be the Sabbath or whatever, however you call the Sabbath anyway. It's never Sunday. You don't find the word Sunday anywhere in the Bible, by the way. You see, brethren, we have to be educated about that. We have to be ready to, to, to tell people that ugly truth if it is. But I did. It was Sunday. It was a Sunday, and I was screaming in a, a in a in a in one of those uh, you know black colonies. I screamed at the top of my lungs. I said, "Your neighbors are now keeping the keeping the mark of the beast. They're all in their Sunday keeping churches, brethren. Why do we keep the Sabbath?" And I exp explain it to them. We need to be explain be now willing and ready to explain it to others who may be asking us. And don't try to jam down the throat of the Gentiles the, the gospel because they cannot understand it. The carnal mind cannot be submitted to God. It doesn't keep the law of God. It cannot be even submitted to God. That's what it says in the Bible. But I didn't believe it. Believe what it says because it's true. 
Don't try to cram it down their throat. We are preaching the gospel for a witness, not for conversion. For a witness, Jesus Christ says, his word is the authority. We're just witnessing to the Gentiles. And we will be teaching them for conversion and eternal life when Christ comes, when he opens up the door, when Satan is no more there to do his work of deception. Please understand that because it's important for well-being. Because in the end, you'll be burned out because nobody will be converted of all those Gentiles that you're trying to convert. Nobody will be converted. You'll be burned out. You'll start doubting that God's word is true because you have wrong understanding of it. And then in the end, you may even give up. Oh, because it's not giving no, it's not giving results. Nobody's being converted. Of course, nobody's converted. The world is not called to conversion now. The world is left to be deceived to the Satan. He's left to the Satan to be deceived, and only certain individuals that God has chosen they are just being converted now. But for a purpose, not for their own salvation only. They're being converted so that they could the Gentiles in the kingdom and under the kingdom of God. When we become the kingdom of God, that we can just teach them all those things for conversion, and then they'll convert it all massively, all of our nations, brethren. But only after Christ comes. Don't be victims of this Protestant mentality, winning the souls and going to no, know, brethren, it doesn't work. It's all wrong. It's not part of God's plan. It's not how God has planned salvation to be carried out. So I have to make these this, this, this additional comments to the main topic, brethren, because I'm afraid that many Sabbath keepers are, are victims of the wrong Protestant theology, uh, primarily Protestant, but it could be wrong theology of any kind. Because they're convinced themselves because they keep the Sabbath. Oh, now they're just so wise and everything. No, they do not understand that in many ways of their thinking, they're still producing the wrong doctrines. They're still perpetrating the wrong ideas, the wrong theology. And they're just bringing themselves, themselves into a very, 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 very serious condition. Because it's not bringing results that they expect. Oh, we understand the truth. It's so simple. Wonderful. Let's give it to the Gentiles now. And the Gentiles will be smart. And they will know, brethren, they will not because their minds are closed. And they're being deceived by Satan. Please understand that. And we are to preach the gospel Christ says for a witness, not for conversion. So I have to always give these additional comments to make sure that you understand it all. And that we are all on the same page. Also, we should compare... If you go to Romans chapter 8, verse 9, there is one verse which is very dogmatic there. It says, now, if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he is not his. Now, what does that mean? Well, it means you're not Christians if you don't have the Spirit, the same Spirit that Christ has. So that, that conclusion is astounding to the rest of the world. It might be astounding to you, but fine. It's what it means. If we are not baptized... Properly baptized, we do not receive the Holy Spirit. Yet, if we do not receive the Holy Spirit, we do not belong to Jesus Christ. As much as we may think that we belong to Him, we don't. And therefore, proper baptism, true Bible commanded baptism is, is a must, is essential. The word baptized, by the way, in your Bibles comes from the Greek word baptizo, which means immerse or plunge into, plunge into the water. So, since the word baptized means to immerse, to say we can just, of course, infer the same conclusion. You see, it's always, it's always, it's always the common sense. If it is immersion, what it says, and we know the world practices something else. So, who is right? Is the Bible, the Word of God, right, or is the world right? Of course, the Bible is right. Which means then that uh, uh, the word baptize means to immerse. Then sprinkling or pouring water is a contradiction to to immersion. And do people, children who that get so-called supposedly baptized that way have as a result the Holy Spirit? No, they don't. As clearly as that. Could they then be Christians? No, they cannot be. They can call themselves lions, tigers, Christians, whatever, and still be something else. They can call themselves Christians and still be pagans because they practice all this paganism and worshiping of the sun god. But in the whole modern Christianity today, the world revolves around the sun worship. Horrible. And besides, those who would say it's proper to sprinkle or pour ignore the plain examples of the Bible. One is in Matthew chapter 3, verses 13 to 17. It's again Jesus Christ, his example. He was baptized in the Jordan River and had 
he had to have been immersed for it says in in matthew chapter uh, chapter 3 in that section of his baptism it says he came up from the water how could he come up out of the water if he was not immersed into the water and why would he have to go to jordan river when he could be just simply sprinkled and that's it also when you go to john chapter 3 verse 23 john the baptist john the baptist went to a certain region Ienon, i-e-n-o-n as it's written in, in in john chapter 3 why because there was much water there why did john the baptist need much water if he could just simply simply take you know a bit of water a few few drops and just sprinkle those who are being baptized no he wouldn't have he wouldn't have needed much water for sprinkling or pouring on people he could just have got the water out of the well or out of whatever uh, pipe if you wish and just sprinkle it oh in the name of the son father and the holy spirit you are baptized go now no brethren he needed much water in Acts chapter 8, you have the account, verses 36 to 39, about the Ethiopian eunuch. The Ethiopian eunuch was traveling, and then when Philip, Philip uh, joined him in traveling, they were just traveling and traveling until they found enough water to go, as it says, go down into. How can you go down into water if Philip could have just got out a glass of water and say, let's hear sprinkling you in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost, and you are now baptized, brethren. That's why immersion, so the Bible tells us that true baptism is not sprinkling, pouring of water, whatever. True baptism is immersion into the water. But what does, it, what does the immersion of a person under water symbolize? Well, if you go to Romans chapter 6, you will see the symbolism, deep symbolism of baptism. I'm not sure how many of you understand that, or if you don't, you have to understand that. Especially you leaders, because you have to explain it to the lay members, and then you have to practice that. Romans chapter 6, verse 3. Or do you not know that as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? You see, the symbolism of our baptism is killing the old man, sinful old man. That's always usually before baptism we, I, I, I at least, advise uh, baptism candidates to read Romans 6, Romans 7, Roman 8, Romans 8, because there, that is where the baptism is explained. And those who do not understand the, 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 the point of the house of Israel, I tell them, go read Romans 11, when the Apostle Paul tells us, I reveal to you a mystery. And now you think, what kind of mystery would that be? And the mystery is, all the nations have to be grafted into Israel. Oh, wait a second. Have to be grafted. It's not they might be, they might, might be, they may not be. No, brethren, it's dogmatically. They have to be grafted into Israel. Well, wait a second. That means that being uh, having identity of being an Israelite is important for salvation, isn't it? Otherwise, why would nations have to be drafted into Israel? Now, do you understand why are we call, called hope of Israel? It means hope of the whole world. It means hope of the whole, all nations, brethren. In fact, the original word, if we take it from Jeremiah 17, means mikveh Israel. And what is mikveh? Mikveh in Hebrew, even to this day, is a ritual cleansing immersion into the water. So the Jews, observant Jews today, before the Sabbath or before some kind of events, they're just going to be ritualistically clean. They just go and immerse themselves into Mikveh. And that's the word Jeremiah uses in chapter 17, saying Mikveh Israel, translated in our Bibles, hope of Israel. That's what is behind our name, brethren. We have to be grafted into Israel. Once we are, once we have the Spirit of God, once we are true Christians, then we are Spirit-led Israelites. And the rest of the world, regardless of their, of their origin, are still pagans. You've got Israelites after flesh who are pagans. Nevertheless, their origin is directly from the 10 tribes, 12 tribes of Israel. But we who turn and keep the law that God gave to Israel, we have become now Israelites. And we're led by God's Spirit, and so that's that's where Spirit-led Israelites, and I always avoid this spiritual Israel because that, that term doesn't mean anything to me, and I don't find it in the Bible. If we have to be grafted, then we become that, and that means that's you know the hope of Israel, as Jeremiah put it, and that hope really refers to all the nations, meaning to all the races, meaning to all of, all of us, and we all have to be grafted into Israel. Some of us are the first fruits grafted already, we become Israelites, and the rest of the world, 
The rest of the Gentile world will be grafted in the world to come, in the kingdom of God. But keep in mind still, brethren, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom. So people who will be living in the flesh still in those thousand years are not the kingdom of God. We are the kingdom of God. Once we are born of the Spirit, once we become co-rulers with Jesus Christ, then we are the kingdom. And the rest of the world of flesh and blood can only be under the kingdom, under the government of the kingdom, because the government of the kingdom will be the, the law of God. And the essence of the law of God is love, by the way. So we will not be ruling like these politicians of today. Like many people just have this, oh, we don't want to rule. Why don't you want to rule? Because they equate ruling and kingdom and government with the corrupted government of the world. Brethren, that's not how it is going to be. The essence of the government of God is love, serving those who are being, who are being uh, taught. That's what it is. That's why we are called to govern. Our, 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 our reward is not to go to heaven and fiddle, fiddle the, the harps and, and praise our God day and night. The reward of the saved, of saved people, the reward of people called now to salvation will be ruling, rulership over the world. And there is nothing, there is nothing bad about it because we will not be ruling like people today, like governments today are ruling. We will be serving people, doing things for their benefits, releasing them from the curse of superstition, uh, demonism, witchcraft, you name it, brethren. Yes, we are called to rule. It's very clear in the book of Reve in the book of Revelation. If you missed it by reading it. Go to Revelation 20 and see the first four verses. And see how that is declared. It's clearly, it says rule, 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 rule. Government of God, government of God, law of God. What is law? Law is ruling our lives. Rule, brethren, we are, we are called to rule the world if we endure to the end. And then we can be hoping that, then we can hope and then we have hope that when we become the kingdom of God, when we inherit the rulership over the world with Jesus Christ, one of the reasons why he came to the earth, by the way, sorry for me if I keep repeating Sabbath after Sabbath, but I keep thinking always there will be some new people that might just tune into certain message and hear this for the first time. One of the reasons he didn't only come to sacrifice himself, he came, brethren, to qualify to be the king of the universe, to be the king over the, over the, over the earth. Uh, sorry, not universe, but the earth. Because who is the king of the earth right now? It's Satan. Since the Garden of Eden, it has been Satan. And Jesus Christ, as you know, was tempted by the Satan. He overcame Satan. Just like we now have to go his footsteps and overcome Satan. And then he qualified. Because of that, he qualified to rule, to rule the world. To depose Satan from the throne over the earth. And when he comes... To take now his rulership, we are to be his co-servants, his many brothers. He's the first one among many brothers. Exactly. We're his brothers now. We're not born again brothers yet because we're flesh and blood. But once we get born of the Spirit at his return, then we'll become his fully brothers, born, 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 born and alive. And then we'll be ruling with him in love, compassion, and all the benefits for humankind. But brethren, those are, that's the vision that you need to have as true Christians. If you're living now, some of you might be living, influenced by the Protestant wrong ideas that you have been called now to save the Gentiles, to convert as many as you can, because otherwise they'll be perishing in somewhere in hell. You cannot be more wrong, brethren. That's horrible. First of all, you'll fail. Second of all, it's going to disappoint you and discourage you. Third of all, you'll be still bewildered. Why in the world have you been called by God? But I just told you why have you been called by God. To rule the world in the kingdom of God. And the kingdom of God will not be the Gentiles still you know, of flesh and blood. The kingdom of God will be us. And we are told in the Bible to be kings and priests. The Apostle Peter says, fine. Of all these people ignorant about spiritual things, we have to be educated about those things in order to administer them properly once Jesus Christ comes. That's important vision. But many, many Sabbath keepers don't have that vision because they think that the major thing between them, be between them that different, differentiates them from the rest is keeping the Sabbath. No, it's not. Sabbath is a test command. Sabbath is something we keep out of love for Christ and Jesus Christ and, and God the Father because they told us, they told us to keep it. 
And out of love for them and devotion for them, we keep it out of gratitude for all they've done for us in our lives. But Sabbath is between us and God, not between us and the world. It's part of Christ-like life, yes. But without character, without Christ-like character, God-like character, if we don't allow Holy Spirit to de develop that in us, we're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. As simple as that. Maybe be keeping the Sabbath all the much that we want. It's the character that needs to differentiate us from the world, brethren. Christ-like character. That we are not going to lie when everybody lies. That we are not going to steal when everybody steals. That we are not going to do anything wrong when everybody does everything wrong. That's what differentiates us from the world. Having the Spirit of God and allowing the Spirit to work in us and to create God-like character. That's what is going to qualify us for the kingdom of God, which will be us and not the world being ruled over by the kingdom of God. So please, it's important that in your mind that you clearly distinguish certain things and understand them. It's important. It's part of baptism. Why is it part of baptism? Because you have to explain it today. All those things to baptism candidates, lest they be living in delusion. Therefore, we continue now in Romans 6, verse 3 and 4. Just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so, we also should walk in newness of life. So we are no longer the old person walking in sins. Now we are walking in newness of life. Verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man or old woman, it doesn't say old child, as you can see, but old man, was crucified with him, with Christ, that the body of sin might be done away with, that might be buried and then taken away by the water. That's why I prefer to go and do baptism in streams, in streams of water, you know, waters that are just flowing, because symbolically the old man, the old woman is then, then, then being, being taken away by the water. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Yes. And may I add, that we should no longer be slaves of wrong doctrines, brethren. We are covering now the Bible, true Bible theology, because I don't want you to be under the influence of all these bad, wrong doctrines circulating all over the world. So baptism is a symbolic burial of the old sinful self. A new person intent on obeying God in every way comes out of the water. Baptism is therefore an outward statement by our actions of the inward determination to obey God and leave our sinful past. That's what baptism means. And that's how you need to explain it to all the baptism candidates. Not to tell them, oh yes, you need to be baptized to keep the Sabbath. Or you need to, well, yes, of course, they are. They need to be baptized to properly keep the Sabbath. Because the, Jesus Christ says again to the woman, Samaritan woman, he tell, told her the well, that my servants do not need to go to this place, to this hill, to that hill, to this location. This My servants will there be serving me in spirit and truth. So we, whether you are in Kampala, or whether you are in Nairobi, or whether you are in Belgrade, whether you are in the northern, northern pole, whether you are in Greenland, whether you are in Australia, wherever we are through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ in our prayers we have access to the throne of God we don't have to go to I don't know capital Canberra or capital Belgrade or or hell holy hill Zion in Jerusalem or you name it we do not because God hears our prayer where we are he hears us wherever we pray because you know because we have access to his throne through Jesus Christ whose sacrifice allowed us to have access he's our our, our high priest now he is our Lord and Savior, so His sacrifice and His he, what His sacrifice really allows us allowed us the way to have access to the throne, brethren. That's the truth. Because you know how people people in this nominal Christianity are talk. Oh, you have to go to the churches to pray. You cannot pray at home. No, you have to go to church, brethren. Where is that written in the Bible? You tell me. I received the baptism request some time ago. Oh, and the, 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 the man says. Uh, but you know, all of these other churches of God, they just require something of you. They require that you go to their churches. They require... I said, no, it doesn't say anywhere in the Bible. It says, repent you and be baptized for the remission of your sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Enough. It doesn't add, oh, by the way, you're required to go to this church, that church. No. No, you're not. The church of God is a spiritual organism, and that's it. 
It's not bounded to our imitation. The hope of Israel Worldwide Church of God, please get in mind, is part of that spiritual organism. We named ourselves that way because we have a certain mission and we want to please God. But that's our human decision to be organized as Hope of Israel Worldwide Church of God. It's not a command from God because you've got various other people with various other names doing the will of God and they're certainly part of the spiritual organism. So that's fine. We do recognize that. So please, again, don't make mistake and think, oh, this is the only true church in the world. There is no other. No, I never said that. And I would never tell you that because that's not true, brethren. How do I know? How do I know with who God is working? Somewhere in Nepal, somewhere in Afghanistan, somewhere in Australia, somewhere in New Zealand, somewhere in Greenland, you name it. I don't know that. How could I know where is the only, only true church in the world? No, I don't. I believe that hope of Israel, World Church of God, is part of the one only true church, because there is only one. But that only one church is a spiritual organism. It may not be, it is certainly not limited to one physical organization like ours. As simple as that, brethren, those are simple concepts that you need to understand them in order not to be, not to be deceived by satanic uh, doctrines being flow, flow, flowing all around, flying all around us and being, being, being promoted in our societies. But I said, baptism is a symbolic burial of the old self. But brethren, it is even more than this, because Paul explains in these verses, we have just read in Romans chapter 6, explains that our baptism is a, also a subtle picturing of our faith in the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And by acting out his death in our baptism, we show our acceptance of his death meaning in our life. And there is another now layer of the truth for all of the Sabbath keepers who keep, who happen to keep the Passover. Many Sabbath keepers will keep the Passover because they think, oh, it's Lord's Supper. No, it's not Lord's Supper. It's the New Testament Passover. And there is no, there is no Lord's Supper, Lord's whatever, Lord's whatever, something. There is nothing like that in the New Testament. So please just don't, don't, don't give the name. And again, but we get fooled by the world. We get fooled by these, 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 the world tendencies, brethren. That's horrible. Jesus Christ kept, as he says in the New Testament, the Passover. And while keeping the Passover, he changed the symbols of the Passover. And he instituted New Testament Passover. Meaning, he said to his disciples, now, from now on, you're not going to be slaughtering the lambs. You're not going to be uh, smearing the blood of the lambs on the doorposts. No, from this point on, you take this unleavened bread, symbol of my body, that is being that was totally crushed and destroyed because of us and our sins, brethren. And you have this this, 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 this this small wine that you drink, wine, alcoholic wine, by the way, and please don't, don't confuse yourselves. The Greek New Testament was written in Greek. You have a special word for grape juice and special word for alcoholic wine. The, the, the word in Greek used in the New Testament Passover is the word in Greek for alcoholic wine. And he said, Jesus Christ says, you take this small amount of wine as a representation of my, my shed blood. Those are the new symbols of the New Testament Passover. So he instituted New Testament Passover at his last Passover. It's not the Lord's Supper, Lord something, I don't know what. Secret, oh, it's secret supper in certain Christian churches. The last supper and all that. Brethren, there is no such terms in the Bible. But we can become victims, you see, uh, unaware that we are victims of, 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 of the traditions and of the teachings of this world. So we keep the New Testament Passover and where we keep it, what do we do it? Why do we do it? Well, because we certainly, regardless of the fact that we want to keep and please God, we are certainly sinners and we certainly slip and we fall and we sin. And then at the Passover, we just every single year, once again, renew our acceptance of Jesus Christ blood and body for the remission of our sins and for our spiritual life and for our eternal life brethren that's the fact and that's the fact that you need to understand that's the purpose of the passover true passover there is no lord's supper it is the passover it was the common passover custom among the jewish people and it wasn't any last supper at all it's just a terminology that this that this deceived Christianity has given to that event. But in that act has a deep, is the most solemn act of all the Christians to renew their covenant that they've entered with God into as their baptism, you see. 
And it's important to understand that, brethren, because there's so much deception there. And we can just unaware, being unaware that we can just fall and become deceived and, 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 and practice things and, and think that we know what we are doing when in fact we don't. So, by acting out Christ's death in our baptism, we show our acceptance of his death, meaning in our life and the result of baptism in our spiritual lives are the forgiveness of our sins and the subsequent receipt of God's Holy Spirit, as we read in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Brethren, the actual process of forgiveness through Christ's blood is called justification. We have had already a sermon on justification. What is justification from a biblical perspective? It's there. It's on our YouTube channel. It's everywhere. You can hear it. We'll just put it on, on our radio world, uh, our internet radio, Hope of Israel Worldwide. And uh, 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 we, 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 we will explain very well what is justification, what it really means. And although proper baptism is prerequisite to receipt of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is actually received in an associated but separate ceremony called the laying on of hands performed immediately after baptism. And in our future manual, we have also explained something to you and to all our members. Baptism is not just a futile ritual that we have to go through and everything is now punky dory, everything is great, May roses are flowering all over. Our, no, brethren, through many trials we are to enter into the kingdom, we will still have trials, we will still have problems, we will still have to overcome our sins because our old, old man doesn't want to die. The old human nature doesn't want to die, brethren. He doesn't want to die, he wants to alive and to be alive and kicking and we all have to be fighting it all the time. But now we are not alone. Now we have the Spirit of God in us after baptism. And so therefore we have an extra divine help in fighting our nature. And then we should be over the time getting more and more and more and more victory over our human nature. And thus, by doing so, we are being overcomers. And by being overcomers, we are perfecting our character. And uh, by doing so, we're qualifying ourselves for the kingdom of God. So forgiveness of sins, brethren, and receipt of the Spirit do not come to us automatically. No, there are qualifications one must meet before baptism. And the first of these qualifications, we covered it already in separate message called What is True Repentance? In where in that one we explained what the true repentance is. So the first one in Acts 2, chapter 38, repentance is the, what is repentance? Is the abhorrence, is that you hate yourself, your past, your sins, your sinful self, that you hate it, that you abhor it, that you can't stand it. And in at baptism, you just show outwardly to God, and perhaps there are other witnesses around, you show to them your decision that you have decided to obey God in the future. Because God is more more involved and more, and you know, sometimes people just think, "Oh, we were so horrible sinners." Brethren, God is not is not interested in your past. God is interested in your future. And those of you all in your mutual relationship and in your thinking about yourself, you should not be concerned about your past anymore. It's gone. There is nothing you can do about it. Christ sacrificed His life to redeem you from the death penalty for the past. You should now be occupied with the future. And the future is still not going to be May Roses. The future is going to have the mark of the beast. The future is going to have a European dictator. The future is going to have the great tribulation. The future is going to have to deal, God dealing with lukewarm Christians. That's all part of the future. And then, of course, eventually, the most glorious future come is the kingdom of God. It's us establishing the government of God over the world, brethren. And then teaching all the Gentiles the way of salvation. And then we'll have then we'll have success. Because right now, God is only calling those whom He decides to call. Remember, I've been many times uh, with all of these many Sabbath keepers I have to quote. I have to quote again the words of Jesus Christ. Because if that is not the, the, the authority in your life, then you're just lost, brethren. Then what is the authority of your life? You just go and live by the authority of this world. In John 6, 44, Nobody can come to me, the words of your Savior. Nobody! Yes, nobody, meaning not your mother, not your cousin, not your brother, not your sister, not your father. Nobody can come to me unless the Father, God the Father, draws him to me. You see? 
In other words, you cannot convert anyone. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work the Protestant way of winning of the souls and all of that. But it doesn't work because it's not true. Nobody can come to God unless God the Father, nobody can come to Christ and become a Christian unless God the Father draws them in repentance. Draws them to repentance and then people repent and people then obey the commandment to be to be baptized then they be baptized and receive the Holy Spirit then they grow spiritually we're still with many problems and fighting their old nature still with various sins oh am I shocked are you shocked well, why should I be shocked what does it say in first John 1 verse 8 we are sinners and those who say there is no sin in him such is a liar and the truth is not in him yes we are sinners brethren that's why we keep, that's why we're commanded to keep the Passover, among other things. Because why? Well, because of that Passover, we again show to God our commitment to again and again and renew our first acceptance of Jesus Christ's baptism. We renew it again by accepting his blood and his, 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 his broken body for the remission of our sins, for the forgiveness of our sins. Because we're still sinners. Oh, we're sinners. Oh, isn't it? Yes, we are sinners. And nobody can tell to me, oh, I'm not a sinner. Because the Apostle John says that you are. And that if you say that you have no sin, you're a liar. And the truth is not in you. So whoever comes to you and tells you, oh, I'm not a sinner. Look how great. I'm in one foot. I'm into the kingdom of God. I'm saved already. I'm, I'm already born again. How can you be born again when Jesus Christ says to Nicodemus that flesh and blood cannot be. You have to be born from above or born again into spirit. But you have all these haughty people walking around, you know, oh, they're just born again. Oh, they're just born again. Oh, and you should be born again. Just receive Jesus in your heart and everything is fine. There is no repentance, brethren. There is no baptism. Just, just say verbally, you accept Jesus and everything is great. Wrong, 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 brethren. But that's the predominant culture in our world. So the first, we have to be we have to repent. The second qualification is baptized. Mark chapter 1, verse 14 and 15. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and, again the words of your Savior, repent and believe the gospel. The gospel is, of course, the true gospel is the kingdom of God. And we're going to cover that in a separate message. Because it's also part of that true biblical theology that you need to understand, that all the believers in the hope of Israel and all the true believers need to understand. So it's faith. The faith is also mentioned in, in the book of Acts, chapter 8, verse 37 through 30, uh, 34, 35, 36, and 37, and in, the, uh, in Mark, chapter 16, verse 15 and 16. And the faith required by a person at baptism cannot be Christ's faith because Christ is not in you yet and you cannot have Christ's faith. The faith required is our own human faith rather than the faith of Jesus Christ in us, which we receive at baptism by his Holy Spirit in us. Galatians 2.16 tells us that very plainly. So before we are baptized, we do not have the Spirit of God and we cannot have the, therefore we cannot have the, uh, uh, the faith of Christ in us. And I'm saying that because you certainly know, you'll just tell me, does it say in the, in the book of Revelations that here is the patience of the saints, those who have, the, those who keep the commandments, have the testimony or have the faith of Jesus Christ? Yes, that's what it says. But to have the faith of Jesus Christ, you have to be baptized. Uh, Galatians chapter 2, verse 16. Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, which involves keeping of the Sabbath. We keep the law, brethren, because we love God and we just return that love to Him. We're not going to be saved by keeping the law. We're saved, as it says here, by faith in Jesus Christ. By faith in Christ and not by the works of the law, for by the works of the law no flesh shall be justified exactly. So the faith that is required before baptism is that people just, whatever they have faith, they have belief in who and what Jesus Christ is, in his message, the gospel of the kingdom of God, and his sacrifice, and that's it. That's the faith required at baptism. After baptism, once you receive the Holy Spirit, then you have the, the, the faith of Christ 
becoming part of you, becoming part of your character, part of your knowledge, because the Spirit of God is going to give it to you. That's why it is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And everything is the gift, brethren, all we have. That's why we should not be, be proud and self-righteous, thinking, oh, how great we are than other people. No, we are not. We're called for a purpose, and we better endure to the end. If we don't endure to the end, we can lose salvation. That's how serious that is. We have called by God, yes, and uh, uh, everything is gift. The Holy Spirit is a gift, faith, repentance, whatever we have in this world is a gift from God, brethren. We have to understand it once for all. It's not anything that, oh, it's our talents, it's our work, is this. Well, the talents and the work and, and, and everything else God has given to us again. So one way or the other, it's all the gift from God. We, in this, my country, we until recently had to deal with very self-righteous people thinking that, oh, there's something special. They're baptized. And all these who are still not baptized are not worthy of their of their their their, their company, their care, their whatever. Wrong, wrong, wrong. We do care, but better we cannot convert anyone. And whoever becomes converted, even conversion is a gift from God. So the faith is toward Christ. You can see that in Acts chapter 20, verse 21. And that's belief in who and what Christ is, in his message of the kingdom and his sacrifice uh, for remission of our sins. Now we can begin, hopefully, to see why an infant or even teenager should not be baptized. Because children are simply too young to understand the deep symbolism or to assume the responsibilities of such decision, decision to enter into the covenant with God by and through baptism. And certainly the living attitudes of mind required for proper baptism, uh, 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 sorry, the living attitudes of mind, of mind they require, that they require for baptism, they preclude anyone being baptized on, be, on behalf of a deceased person, of course. Finally, brethren, proper baptism requires the proper words be said. And that's why in our future manual we have just stipulated very clear attitude. Whatever you were baptized, wherever you were baptized in before, it doesn't matter. You were baptized into the churches of this world, most likely. And you were baptized into the Trinity, into the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Wrong, wrong, wrong. The proper Greek word is, is within. Within the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What does that mean? Well, we sinned against God. So repentance is toward the Father. We believe in we believe in, in, in sacrifice of Jesus Christ. So our faith is toward Christ and accepting his sacrifice. And as a result of all that, as a result of our repentance and acceptance of Christ, the result will be reception of the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's what it really means. It's not baptism into Trinity. Now back to these churches. These churches baptize their members into their churches. They baptize their members into Trinity. They baptize their members into all kinds of stupid things. Brethren, we have just read in the Bible. We are baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Period. Period. So proper words be said. If you're baptized in the any church of this world, all these churches, even though they call themselves Christians, they're just deceived by Satan the devil. Revelation 12, 9 is very clear. Oh, are you saying that? No, I'm not saying it. It's not me saying the Bible says that the whole world is deceived, except for the called, faithful, called, elect, faithful, and, 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 and called, chosen, and faithful. So if you've been called and you want to be chosen and faithful, then you have to be properly baptized. If you're baptized in the, in, in the world, in the church of this world, that's invalid baptism. You thought that you were, oh, I heard once, oh, I was choosing you know, between the word and, and God, the world and God. And I said to her, yes, you were thinking you chose between world and God, but you did not receive proper instruction before baptism of what you are supposed to repent. And therefore, you never repented of that. You never repented, for example, of not keeping the holidays. Not keeping holidays, brethren, in sin is sin like any other sin. And you were not instructed to repent of Trinity and all of that, so therefore you continue living in your sin, even though in your mind you thought you were choosing between the world and God. No, that's not true, I said. You were deceived. That's why in our manual you'll have very clear instruction. Those who are supposedly baptized... In whenever, into whatever, 
disregard that. They have to be properly baptized, as the Bible teaches, by a minister of God, by servant of God, preacher of God, you name it, by the servant of God, even if it's, it's a lay member. It doesn't matter if there's no ministry, even lay members can do that. By lay members who believe and teach the true doctrines of God. Because how can you receive the Holy Spirit from a minister who is basically serving the devil? Preaching Christmas, Easter and all the rubbish. How can you? Think logically once again. Turn on your common sense. So, we should indeed be baptized, yes, within... We should be baptized, it says in Acts 2.38, in the name of Jesus Christ. Which means that the person who does the baptism, he's doing it, it's usually a minister. Uh, but he, the minister, the person doing it, is not doing it on his own authority. He's doing it by the authority of Jesus Christ. And once again, the Greek in Matthew 28, 19, it's not in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Wrong translation, the Greek word for in should be better uh, uh, translated into into or within or within the frame of. That's what it means. Because again, our repentance is to God. Our faith is toward Jesus Christ. As a result of our repentance and faith, we receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So those three elements are involved. They're not Trinity. Because God is family and not Trinity. And before anybody is baptized, the core teaching of the Bible has to be understood. God is not Trinity. He's a family into which a numerous number of people can be born again. It's a family that accepts now millions and after the second resurrection and conversion of all the Gentiles, millions and billions of new members. So it's open family. Right now we are still part of that family, but we're not born again yet, brethren. We're just... We're just conceived by the Holy Spirit. We're still conceived children of God. We're still children of God. We were just not born again yet. We're just conceived. At Christ's return, we should be born again because we'll be changed into spirit, into immortality. No longer will be mortal. No longer will be depend on the material things. No longer will we will be having to get into marriage. No longer will we have children. We, you know, all the children we have, that's fine. That's it. Once we become into this glorified body as Jesus Christ has, we are going to be born again. Sinless, born again, ruling members of God's family. That's the truth, the basic truth that all of you being part of the hope of Israel, wherever you come from, wherever you be, be, have been taught, be, you have to really overcome those wrong doctrines and start believing the Bible. You have to understand, and all the Baptists and candidates have to understand this crucial, pivotal thing. God is a family, open family, waiting for many more brethren of Jesus Christ who are conceived at baptism with the Holy Spirit. They are now conceived, and then they will be born again at Jesus Christ's return. So the family will just drastically expand. At Christ's return, that will be the first resurrection. Then we have the restoration, restoration of the government of God over the earth. And all the mortals live, still living in the earth, teaching the Gentiles away. Then comes the second resurrection of all the people who ever died and never really called by God or never understood the truth anyway. There will be billions and millions and trillions of people. We don't know how many. All of our, all of our, all of our, all of our, uh, aborted children all over the world there are millions and billions of them are going to come back to life that's another thing that you should know because the spirit in man that the apostle Paul reveals which is not found by a science has never been established by any religion and nobody knows the truth about the spirit in man brethren only God people God's people know that truth and you if you're leaders of God's people you have to know that truth that spirit of man is a spiritual how can I call it? It's something spiritual. It's not material, meaning you cannot destroy it. And once a child is conceived, the spirit of man is automatically becomes attached to the still small and undeveloped human brain of that fetus. And once they abort that child, even though they destroy the body, the spirit of man is not destroyed. The spirit of man goes where? Goes to God. And God is keeping it for the time of resurrection. So all those children, millions and millions are going to come. And to be able to grow into adults. And to be able to be offered spiritual eternal life if they want to accept it. 
And that's the family of God, brethren. God is a family open to receive, receive people, members that will be born of the Spirit, born again at some point in the future, whether it be the first resurrection or what it'll be, it'll be after the second resurrection when the when the humans, mortals qualify, they'll be at some point in the future. All of your Baptists and candidates have to understand that basic doctrine. And please ditch this Trinity for all time and please don't use Matthew 28, 19 to say, oh, it must be Trinity. No, it's not. <coughs> it's a wrong translation of Greek. Brethren, we are baptized not into a denomination of men, no matter what its name is, no matter what group you have been baptized. If it's a true church, no matter what the name people chose for that group, if it's true church, it's a spiritual organism, if you're baptized, into the name of Jesus Christ, baptized into the body of Christ, which is spiritual body. If you're baptized into the body of Christ, that's the proper baptism, brethren. So we're not baptized into any denomination or sect of humans, but through the receipt of the Holy Spirit, we're baptized right into the body of Christ, which composes the church. It's composed of people being conceived by the Holy Spirit and led by the Spirit, no matter where they live, no matter where they live and no matter who they are by origin and no matter anything else, by that Spirit they, they receive their baptism into the body of Christ which is spiritual. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 13, I think we already quoted it in past Sabbath, so I'm not going to read it again. Check it for yourself. Dry, you know, write it down. If you're in the Bible, just don't be just sitting idle. The Bible, if you've been, uh, what did I say, the Bible, I said if you're in the in, the, in, in, in services, don't just sit like, like dummies. The true church is a school. In every school and every college, people just take notes, don't they? Fine, take notes of what you listen. Don't have, you don't have to, when you take notes, you don't take notes of every word. Just take notes of the most important points. So you can have it, you can just review it, you can just have it and you can help your concentration. Uh, not by sitting idle and, and, and thinking, you know, whatever. Taking notes is a good practice, so please start doing it. And even use your Bible. The, the, the verses I mentioned, you just go to all the verses, you can just underline them, you can put your own comments on the margins. Brethren, the Bible, I've said it a million times, I'll say it a million and, 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 and I'll say it a zillion times until we all get it. The Bible itself is a book, it's just a book, it's an item, it's not holy. What is holy is what is written in the Bible. That is holy. So if you turn your Bible into a textbook by writing your own notes, your own comments, your own whatever, your own thoughts, your own conclusions, that's fine. That's excellent. Next time you read over those verses, you'll say, oh, they'll just jump straight into your eyes. You'll think, oh, oh, that's what it really means. It's very helpful for the Bible study as well. But, you know, use your Bible as a textbook. Use, take notes, brethren. Behave like students. Because that's what we are, disciples of Jesus Christ. Disciples are students, so please behave like students. And in many of our cultures, that's, oh, you know, writing down notes. Oh, no, people remember that. They'll just, they'll have their great memory. They'll remember that. Of course, they don't remember that. Don't rely on your fallible human memory. Use pen and paper. It's not in vain that humans have invented pen and paper. Just use pen and paper and... Keep the notes. So, just one comment about John the Baptist statement in Matthew 3, 11, that Jesus would baptize with the Holy Spirit. It does not mean that people who are baptized with the Holy Spirit, they just get in this frenzy, frenzy speaking in tongues and all that. Wrong called tongues. This merely refers to the actual receipt of the Holy Spirit after baptism. When the laying on of hands ceremony happens, then it's receipt of the Holy Spirit. And these, these, these tongues, they have nothing to do with, 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 with the Holy Spirit, nothing to do with God. Brethren, we do have a booklet on baptism. We do have explanation about baptism now here in this message. It's enough. I've just added a few more other explanations for those of you coming now from various cultures because you've all been exposed to the wrong cultures as I've been exposed to mine. And we have all imbibed without even thinking, without being aware. Sorry about this blast. That the pagans are preparing for their New Year's. So there's their rehearsal. They've been, they've been throwing firecrackers 
you know, just to just to announce the coming of their crazy night. The craziest night in the year is the New Year's Eve in Serbian tradition. Trust me. It's going to be like hell here. It's going to be like a battlefield in two, in two, two. Yeah, you hear it. They're just preparing the battlefield. It will be like a cannonade. My poor cats, all, you know, all of a sudden, all they just wake up and they're just alert. What is that? Because the, the, the hearing, the, the, the sense of hearing in cats is much stronger than in humans. You can just imagine how that, that blasts in their, in their ears. Brethren, we are not to be like pagans. Anyway, in conclusion, we will have, all the leaders will have very soon, service manual. All these things, the basic, basic doctrines, the things we have to understand, justification, repentance, uh, salvation by faith, baptism, I've been, re I've been even uh, 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 explaining that in messages because I want them to be recorded. I want you to have oral messages, but I want you also to have manuals should you always have to be reminded of something. So let's conclude. Yes, baptism is a most important subject. And although... And through, in the last 2,000 years, many religions have professed to baptize properly and have not. Baptism is accurately understood today by God's true church, and it's done exactly as Jesus Christ commanded. And that's it. However, to say that hope of Israel is the only true church and no other out there is wrong. Hope of Israel is part of the spiritual body of Christ. It's part of the true church, which is the spiritual organism and yes we following the example of jesus christ and understanding the baptism we practice it but with understanding from the biblical perspective so uh, it's important because repentance is the first step toward baptism and then uh, uh, toward baptism and, and, and to salvation at all that's the first step the second one commanded is baptism uh some of